I want to talk about your first venture first. So Favor is a runner app here in Austin, Texas, and really across Texas that did not make its way outside of Texas or did at one point and then you brought it back home. Yeah, so Favor is an on-demand delivery platform. People use it to get anything from Torchy's Tacos to something from H-E-B brought to them. I've so, had many lunches delivered by Favor here at the nice. headquarters of the Austin Board of Realtors. <laughs> <laughs> but some of our friends listening are outside of Austin, so I wanted to be sure that everybody's got a level set on that. How did you start Favor? So I started Favor when I was recently finishing up college, like I guess that was nine years ago now. <laughs> So a little baby. <laughs> me and my co-founder Ben started it. He was a pizza delivery driver when he had or- originally had the thought, and he was thinking to himself, you know, it's it's great to be able to deliver from this one restaurant, but if I could deliver from any place, then you could have faster delivery times because you'd probably be closer to the next place, and then you'd also be able to make more money as a delivery driver. So it was with that thought of how can you get anything delivered that we set off and tried to figure out how we would approach that. So one of the first things that we had done was we just got a Coding for Dummies book (laughs) and we set up shop in his parents' basement. Nothing like a DIY app. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So neither of you had any that type of technical or development experience at all? Yeah, like I had gone to school for marketing and and Ben had gone to school for civil engineering. So nothing to do with how he would build apps. A natural fit in the tech world. Perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And remind us at that time, were there other delivery competitors? I mean, obviously now and after the last year, all of us rely on everything to be delivered and we're totally spoiled rotten. But (laughs) yeah, I mean, back then it was a real brand new thing. I mean, in the marketplace, the whole gig economy phenomenon was just getting started. Yeah, Uber hadn't even like done their peer to peer system Mm -hmm. to get rides yet. And it was like through that lens that we were thinking, man, wouldn't it be cool if there was this future world in which you could have um, you know, people being able to work from behind their phone without a boss. Yeah, sort of interesting, too, that you set to solve that problem based on the consumer need, but also really based on the employee need, like the, the gig guys need, right? That I can yeah. make more money if I can connect the dots in my deliveries. And most that's people, a very different perspective. Yeah, totally. Like most people are always like, oh, like when did you think you wanted wanted to eat anything, you know, and but it, you know, it was always from the driver's side. And honestly, most of the stuff that we're building as a company was mostly fixated on the driver and how we could make their experience better. How do you think that made you unique as other delivery services started to come about and you were sort of starting to compete head on? Well, I think to be a good service, if you focus on the delivery truck times, and that's all about having the drivers at that key moment, then you'll be able to win customers. Um, The delivery market got really hot across the entire country. Uh, You had asked before where we had gone. So we had first mover advantage in Texas. So we had launched Austin, then Dallas, then Houston. And then we had raised some money to go scale nationally. And uh, it was at that time where the delivery market got pretty hot. So the likes of Postmates and DoorDash and Uber Eats started to enter in to some of the cities that were starting to launch outside of Texas. Yeah, I can actually distinctly remember a time that I had been frequenting favor in Austin, Texas, had to travel to D.C. for work, and did not know how to order something. (laughs) (laughs) It was a real problem for me that you had not expanded properly, but (laughs) but I got over it. You wanted to use it all over the place. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) I'm a favor fan. Um, So, okay, so then 2020... Uh, is a crazy year, obviously, in many, many ways. But delivery service especially was like a lifeline for a bunch of us. I mean, how does that make you feel that this thing that you started with your Coding for Dummies book was then like very integral to people's basic needs? Oh, man. I mean, I'm so proud at the work that the team was able to do and, and helping to turn it into what it is today. Yeah. I mean, just this past weekend I was at the opening game for Austin FC. Yeah. And they had Go Verde. Some, yeah, <laughs> Verde. <laughs> and they had a big um favor advertisement on the teleprompter and I'm like, man, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. And uh I mean especially like you said, during COVID last year, restaurants have always 
been one of the most likely to fail businesses. Mm -hmm. Just hard to have business or so much competition inside of it. And then you add something like COVID into the mix and it was really hard for restaurants. So the fact that we're able to be a lifeline for them and then also provide a lot of jobs to recently unemployed people that weren't expecting to lose their job from COVID feels really good that it was such an important business last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess the gig economy, too, while it had har- started before, was also really integral to our continued recovery economically as well. Yeah, for sure. So that's cool. Okay, so then Favor is bought by HEB. What year did that happen? That happened four years ago now. Yeah, and so for folks outside of Texas also, HEB is like the brand to have with regards to grocery shopping especially, but um, just such a strong community brand, such a strong community engagement partner. Did you just feel a natural fit there? Yeah, I mean, it was great that we both have the same Texas footprint. Yeah. It's amazing how big HEB is oh, of only now. being just in yeah. the state of Texas. Yeah. And I think we had around 50,000 delivery drivers working for Favor at the time we sold it to HEB. And HEB has like 100,000 employees. So it's just a massive partnership, a massive a brand to be able to merge. partner with. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Do you, how much are, do, are you still involved in the business day to day at um, all? So when that happened, I uh, started to figure out what I wanted to work on next. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, okay. So then you turn your eyes towards real estate, of all things. (laughs) How did that pivot happen? (laughs) Burritos and apartments, tomato, tomato. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I know. If I can deliver this, I can certainly deliver housing. (laughs) (laughs) No. Like, um, so so I think there was a couple of things going on. So the first is just both food and housing are basic Maslow hierarchy of needs. So Mm. if you can have them work, they're massive markets. Yeah. And um, everybody needs them. Everybody wants them. Everyone needs them. Yeah. yeah. And and we, um, like, the big thing about food delivery was all about trying to provide uh, transparency into a process that was happening offline. Okay. Um, You know, how can you know when the driver is leaving the restaurant and then have that inform something that was going to happen next? Yeah. And we, we saw the same type of thing inside of housing. Like, how could you take different data about the properties and expose it in interesting ways that would make for a more streamlined transaction? Yeah. Do you think, or, or at least maybe, maybe I should say it this way, I think that transparency has led to trust yeah. in a way that consumers were very uncomfortable with aspects of different businesses changing. So in real estate especially, I think about... The opportunities for technology to provide faster, more efficient solutions, but they require an element of trust, too. I don't want just anybody in my list at home. I'm not sure what they're going to do there, but the transparency can kind of fill the gaps on that. I totally agree. agree. I mean, I I think that it's one of the bigger purchases that you make as a person. You spend about a third of your money on um, on housing or more in Austin, Texas. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And um, and so. You know, and it's also just an incredibly stressful yeah. thing. You're, you're trying personal. to balance a lot of pieces of moving out of your current position and try to find something else. Yeah. You know, there's like in Austin being so hot, there's bidding wars on houses almost. They move off the market really quick. So yeah. um, the more you can build trust through design and good mobile products, I think it's really important. Okay. So you think you can bring transparency to the process and you've launched what? Tell us about it. Yeah. So we're building what we call an end-to-end leasing platform. So we partner with different busy agents and property managers and real estate investment trusts to assist in leasing the portfolio of homes. Um, So what that would look like practically is... um, a home becomes uh, vacant and or it becomes ready to get marketed, we can facilitate getting yard signs set up, locks on the property, um, taking photos, running all the tours, doing all the back office stuff like processing the applications, all of the marketing and working the leads and renters that are interested in that property. Um, So from you know, here's a home that has to get leased all the way through lease sign. We're trying to digitize and streamline that process. Yeah. And then uh, what opportunities have you found to provide greater transparency in the way that you're doing it versus others? So I, I think there's lots of areas to provide opportunity, like provide um, transparency in that process that makes for a better experience. So one thing that comes to mind is just being able to collect tour feedback and display that to the property owners so that they can um 
address different concerns that the runners might have. Yep. Um, you know, maybe they don't have a washer and dryer. And then the five people that tour that weekend were like, man, I would have run into that place for sure if it had a in-unit washer dryer. Well, they could make mod- modifications to that property. And then um, that can help the owner ultimately fetch higher rents or get the best possible prospect into their property. What made you want to focus on lease transactions as opposed to residential resales? So for me, when we started it, I was a renter and had always been a renter. And I'm just seeing all of my friends being renters longer and longer. I mean, this is happening nationally. I think Um, we've had a, a gravitation towards just renting We've traded in the white picket fence yeah. and nice yard to ACL tickets <laughs> and an education from good school. They do cost almost the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. And, um, and so I just see the world moving more and more towards renters mm-hmm. um, and renting longer. And, and I didn't, uh, being a renter myself, you know, and having to like go check out all these houses and then go hand deliver certified funds checks to Round Rock <laughs> and stuff. I just was like, man, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. What, how do you feel like the more traditional property managers and lease agents have welcomed you into the market or are they scared of you? I think that people, especially in Austin, are very receptive to, to new things and innovation. And I think that um, a lot of the people that we've been partnering with as our early customers, they all value their time and they also value their brand. Yeah. And they see us as not a threat, but rather a way to be more efficient as a company and also make themselves look good with the people that they interact with. Who is more your customer, the brokerage agents or the consumer that needs to lease the property? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, it started off as just being the end users, being the renters. Mm-hmm. Um but as we've been growing as a business, most of the tools that we're building are all more internally tools fa- focused on those brokerages and those agents instead of the, the renters. Yeah. And then so then what role do you see the company that I run, the MLS, to play in regards to also being in the marketplace with you? Yeah. So the MLS is an incredible way to market properties and interact with other agents in the community. Um, Some all would say the... it's the best way to market those properties. <laughs> but... <laughs> you might be biased in that Yeah, way. <laughs> perhaps. Um, so we take all the properties and we put them on the MLS and we offer a buyer side commission. So you do. And... You fully leverage the MLS as well. Totally. Cool. Clearly, you know the value. That's right. <laughs> okay, this interview's done. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so what are you hoping to kind of build out? What's the future product pathway for Sunroom? What more will it do? Yeah, so... Um, we're just building a lot of uh, tools for those agents and then owners of the property to mm-hmm. get real-time updates on the property, notifications about any granular thing that might be happening with their property. Yeah. You know, things like someone has started an application or an application is ready for you to review and accept, um, or here's the photo of the lockbox that we just set up. Yeah. Everything to just build peace of mind and trust for them and have all of those things be accessed through their phone with a really slick, easy-to-use app. Yeah. Um, do you see a future where there's a continued relationship between the lease tenant and the, the or the property tenant and Sunroom as well? That's a good question. Think about like the amount of communication that happens between property managers and tenants, and it's rough. I mean, it's an arduous and tedious business. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely an opportunity to um, how you can assist after the move-in, and I even think like right now we've mostly been focused on that. Um, lease through lease sign transaction but yeah. even just around the move process oh yeah the move is like awful <laughs> how you can add visibility into all of the utility providers how you can connect them with the best service for yes. for internet how yeah. you can facilitate the movers to come and, and get things situated mm-hmm. so i could see us building out some of those marketplace functionality around that mm-hmm. um the whole life cycle of that property is really long and because these are so hard of things to code because you're really trying to do what you would previously have happen face to face and through lots and lots and lots of phone calls yeah happen through an app we've been super busy with just that first part of the transaction yeah so like what chapter of coding for dummies is that in <laughs> or are there real developers now <laughs> yeah now now we have a team we've got uh five or six engineers on the team and yeah. and um we had actually just raised some funding this past year $11 million new money to help us. Um, Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, talk to me a little bit about that fundraising experience. I feel like everyday people do not know how that works or what it's like, but there's a lot of like entrepreneurial spirit that does match what our agents do every day, what realtors are doing in the marketplace. What's it like for you when you have to go do that? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I agree. Agents are entrepreneurs. They're building their business and they're telling their story yeah. and are trying to differentiate themselves from any other agent mm -hmm. so that they can win more clients. And I think that the same rings true with entrepreneurs. These venture capitalists and angel investors, they're looking at so many deals all the time. So they really want to be able to buy into a vision that they could see happen. And so a lot of that just comes down to you know, being out there, telling your story, saying how it's different than the other things in the marketplace. How, what, have you learned any tips that you could pass on to our folks listening? Let's see. So, you know, some of the things that come to mind um, for me as an entrepreneur that were really helpful. One was go on this journey with someone that you're friends with, yeah. you know, because it's it's hard. And so if you could um, do it with someone else yeah. so it doesn't feel like work. I think that's a good positive. Yeah. I think a second thing that comes to mind is just believe in yourself and don't be afraid of the challenge. You know, I think a lot of times people see things as titles or this thing that they can't do. I've always just embraced the next hard thing and then uh, learned it kind of in the moment and just done whatever we had to to get to that next stage. Yeah. And then I think the third um, thing that I would tell an aspiring entrepreneur is um, – is just kind of embrace the challenge and be okay with that pain and uncertainty at times because it's just a long, hard process. Yeah. And I think the the more you can just fight through it and get to that next position, the more likely you are to succeed. I love it. Okay, I want you to wrap this up by telling me um, what Sunroom story sounds like when you pitch it real quick. Yeah, so Sunroom is a uh, self-service leasing platform. Love it. That was very quick. <laughs> Zach, thanks so much for hanging out. I'm super excited to have an Austin guest. I'm super excited for folks to get to know, know more about Sunroom. Thanks. Thanks for having me on.